one of the most important things that you can think about is your speed of development and how fast you can get new products or changes out in the market into the hands of the customers. And what matters there is the people who are creating that code, who are creating that content, their ability to do so quickly, their ability to do so reliably, and to be able to troubleshoot, test, engage, and monitor how the customers are working with what's out there. Welcome to the CIO Exchange podcast, where we talk about what's working, what's not, and what's next. I'm meeting Porter De Leon. This conversation is part of our Lead Forward series, where we talk with technology leaders about the real stories behind the themes of innovation, talent, and experience. In this episode, we interview Tiho Bajic, CEO of LTSC Software, to find out more about the evolution of DevOps and his vision for overcoming siloed developers, ops, and security teams for fast, consistent, and scalable operations across environments. He explains the importance of developer lifestyle and flexibility to ensure they can remain effective while working in a supportive culture while the barriers between teams are removed. During the discussion, Tio expresses what he considers to be newer and better ways of measuring developer productivity. He tells us what he thinks about the developer and operations relationship, shedding light on how best they can integrate and interact to be influential on productivity, progress, and profitability. Tiho also delves into how LTSE is innovating investment, experimentation, and scaling for companies in an effort to help them find continuous success. So I think it's undeniable that developer experience is paramount for a whole bunch of different business reasons, for faster time to market, getting ideas out there, for being competitive, for differentiation. And one thing that's evolved over the last few years is that remote, that hybrid developer experience, not having everyone be in an office, which was always interesting that developers were brought into a central space into, instead of being in their own creative space. So I kind of wanted to start the sort of the idea or the conversation around what's that developer experience? How has it been with the evolution of hybrid or remote work? And give me a sense of your perspective, Tio, on the critical importance, starting out with that developer experience, why it's so important that, that developers have the capabilities to just ideate, to execute. If you are a technology company, you're focusing your innovation on technology. One of the most important things that you can think about is your speed of development and how fast you can get new products or changes out in the market into the hands of the customers. And what matters there is the people who are creating that code, who are creating that content, their ability to do so quickly, their ability to do so reliably, and to be able to troubleshoot, test, engage, and monitor how the customers are working with what's out there. So this developer lifestyle really matters, and developer experience really matters. And that's why at LTSC, we pride ourselves at really making sure that in addition to LTSC school and all the other things that we do when we onboard new employees, especially developers at our company, have their laptops set up right away, have cookbook, so to speak, ready to go. And on day one, they're able to push even trivial, you know, at least the trivial change up the stack and see how that all percolates through. So by the end of day one, they should be able to be fully productive as much as possible from the technical point of view. Yeah, no, that makes sense too. And I mean, that developer experience is, and there's tooling, there's culture, there's a whole bunch of things that we want to tackle today. And so that first piece, it sounds like onboarding is, of course, critically important. What's that experience like? And as they're working, you said something that I thought was really important, which was lifestyle. I like the way that you put that. I think that, that, that it puts a lot of the different components of everything into, I think, one really great word, which is lifestyle. I'm going to, I'm going to use that developer lifestyle from now on. And what is that? What are you seeing in that evolution of that developer lifestyle? Now people are getting an opportunity to work where they want, how they want, with with tools that are far more fluid and flexible than they were before. What's been the shift in the developer lifestyle? I'll just go back. Like I've been in startups and I started as an engineer now for 20 years. And a lot has changed over those 20 years, you know, when it comes to writing code, committing that code, getting that code built, executed, maybe printed <laughs> yes. on a CD, it is, shipped. It, it's yeah, a little like, bit different now, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot different. Like that whole speed, that lifestyle becomes like really, really interesting. And I had early on, I stumbled into the open source community. And I was fascinated by this lifestyle that 
developers who were com core to some of the open source libraries or, or platforms, frameworks that, that we were using, that they were all around the planet. And a bunch of them never saw each other, never met each other in person. And this was prior to Zoom, so they never had video calls. Yet they were able to create something extremely valuable, something that was critical to our building commercial software for which my first company, we got to a point of about 400, 500 engineers that all had to sit within 500 feet of each other. And it, that always fascinated yeah. me. And was that, that, so was that was a requirement? So they had to like, so this was a centralized requirement, right? They all had yeah, to be in the same a, space yeah, we, physically? Yeah, the, the, the first company yeah. was like, basically, we had some sales engineers who would go and travel to the customer site, but... But we had a in, very in-office culture with set working hours, with, with all of that. And yet, we relied on some of the open source that was not built that way at all. And that always fascinated me. And then one, once I got a chance to build my own companies, to be the first engineer and to set that culture, as, as well in my life stages, became married and got kids, moved around. That flexibility, ability to do the work, ability to really be effective, and to not measure the k log kilo lines of code, or, or how many <laughs> bugs that. got fixed, or how many, yeah, or how many. I, but think that's about a, it. That's, like, that's like, an old IBM did, thing, isn't it? K-locks. <laughs> it is, it is. But I was in these environments where, you know, it was like 9 to 5, for example, for developers. Well, it was like more than that. But like just it was like 9 to 5 for developers, and you couldn't like log out prior to that. It's like, well, you're not on a call. You're not, you're not minding a, a station or, or, or a live phone line. Sure, like if you are on call and page you, you carry your brick around your waist, but for, ping, for paging you, but like you don't, you don't necessarily need to be there. But like for somehow, you know, there was the corporate culture. So I was fascinating, fascinated that we were measuring developer productivity, whether it be in kilo lines of code or, you know, how many hours people were at the desk where at the same time we were using yeah. the software. And that's that K-Lock. That's like 10,000 or 1,000 no. lines of code, right? K-Lock is 1,000 right. yeah, yeah, lines of code. Yeah. Yeah. I but think it's, it's an like, IBM it, thing. <laughs> oh, it's, an, it's an old old school thing. I'm just kind of like talking about it as an example of, of something that in practice is proven to be completely wrong when you're measuring developer productivity because we all write code exactly. differently. And so like, why were we so fascinated in the early 2000s in this company I was at to like have developers in the seat for a specific period of time, when at the same time we were relying on open source software that was not built that way. And a lot of those contributors were probably not even doing that as a full-time thing. And so that got me started. Did it feel crazy then? I mean, when you had, when you saw this beautiful stuff that was being created, did it feel a little crazy even early on that, that developers had to be in this one place physically when you were creating something in, digitally where you could literally be anywhere? Was that, was, was that a common conversation? Yeah, no, it, it really fascinated me. And, and get this, like at the height of this, I actually, because I was customer facing a lot, I actually had a laptop that <laughs> and, a, and a desk station that would plug my <laughs> laptop in and was supposed to be there, but it was yet okay to travel <laughs> yeah, to go yeah. to the customer site into their data center. So clearly I had to be in multiple places. And so that fascinated me to the point where like something felt wrong and obviously I was not the only one. And so in the next startup that, that I got to build, and I was the first engineer, so I was able to influence the culture a lot, we talked about that flexibility even more so. And then with every startup and with every project, and you know, now 20 years later, I've run startups in nine different countries. I had, at some points, I had people, you know, as they say, follow, following the sun in terms of where engineers sit and, and, and where they live. And six years ago, when we were starting at LTSC, we jokingly were saying at the time how we need to be trilingual because we need to understand the language of Silicon Valley, we need to understand the language of Wall Street, and we need to understand the language of Capitol Hill. And our engineers need to be trilingual and well-versed in understanding the customers for those three different areas. And that's a customer focused lens. So then the developers, I think I love that and love that. And I don't, I want to make sure that we highlight that because I think it's so important that the developers creating the experience right. you need to understand the customers that's, that's right. creating the experience for it. I know that sounds, yeah. it sounds commonsensical. It sounds like obvious, but it's, it's something that is so incredibly critically important. And, and maybe you can give me your perspective, maybe isn't part of all of the cultures isn't part of all the developer lifestyles. It's very much, hey, here's the problem. Here's the code I need to write. Write the code. Yeah. 
do the unit testing, put in security, et cetera, and customers may not be a focus, but that does seem like a cultural component. So something that you put in the culture of the companies that That's you are right. running. That's right. Yeah. And, and, and I find that personally, again, I'm talking back to the developer lifestyle. I find that a lot more interesting to me personally to be able to see how the code I write actually ends up being used and how it impacts the customer and what it does. And a lot of times it's not as simple as like, well, let's have a discovery cycle and now go back to my dark lair and write some code for six months and ship it to you on a CD <laughs> and everything's going to be there perfect. Like, of course, it won't work that way, it turns out. <laughs> and so it's like a contact sport. I like that contact sport. So it's part of like the developer lifestyle and then getting actually writing the code is a contact sport where you have to go and you have to smash into reality, engage with customers, get in there and really understand like what the real world life is like. And I think some great examples I've had is like when people are creating software for the healthcare vertical, for example, and someone's like, it's trying to care for somebody who's either really ill or someone who has some medical condition and there's some interaction, there's a human connection there and software is a part of facilitating the process but at the same time, understanding what that human connection and the communication is a critical. And you sounded like you, you're looking at Silicon Valley, you're looking at government, Capitol Hill, public sector, um, you're looking at Wall Street critically and saying, well, what is that? What are those experiences like? And how do developers really understand that? And then how do they build that into the developer lifestyle? That's exactly right. Because you need to understand in some cases that you have compliance, that you need to, right? That, that there are other things that you need to really satisfy it's not just about writing code. Like you have, you have a lot more that you need to take into consideration. Yeah. So talk about LTSC and other of the, some of the companies that you built and you kind of alluded to those. How did you build that culture? How did you build that developer lifestyle so that you could create these great customer experiences? And at the same time, the developers could express the creativity, could have the, the whole CI, CD, constant delivery, yeah. fluid experience and, and work the way that they want to work. First is... It has to be run by people. It's a contact sport, so it has to be run by people who are in contact with the customer, who are in contact with the code base, people who are really living this lifestyle. And I find that too many leaders in you know, engineering organizations are, aren't actually the developer, and they, they represent some sort of a, a proxy. And with levels of indirection, things may be lost. And so I've been a number of times very fortunate that I'm writing code <laughs> and or I'm working with people directly who are writing a bunch of the code. And so we get to set some rules or we, or we get to really get an opportunity to understand what matters to the customer and how best we can deliver it and how best we can use some of the tooling that continues to be ever more so wonderful when it comes to improving how quickly you can write, test, deliver code today. Yeah. And do you see as one of the challenges, I mean, you just mentioned leaders, people who are, whether in lines of business or whether the executives at the top, not fully understanding what that developer experience is or could be, or the perspective of the developer. You think that's a major challenge in companies really creating great customer experiences, really getting ideas faster to market, not understanding how developers work and what that developer lifestyle should be in order for them to accomplish the key business goals that they're trying to accomplish? Do you find oh, that as a big challenge? Oh, absolutely. Think about going to a local artisanal shop where people marvel at a person who is blowing glass and creating something beautiful or marvel at a chocolatier or marvel at, like, we admire their craft. Right? And we ask these questions. You go to a vintner in a, in a vineyard and they explain to you about all of the colors and I don't know the jargon of, of wine as well, but like they explain, they have, <laughs> yeah. they have their own language. And the language. oak and, and the oak, aroma yeah, and, and all that stuff. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Earthiness yeah. and all that. But like, so, so they yes. have their own jargon, right? Like each one of these like crafts, they it develops and software writing code and it's a craft, right? And you develop your own jargon and, and you need to engage, so you need to engage with, with people who are creating, who are craftspeople who are creating this valuable thing, you need to really study and understand and appreciate what they do and what's needed for them to be successful in, in, in that craft. You think it'd be good for these executives instead of going wine tasting, maybe they could go to code tasting. They yeah. could have like hearing sommeliers yeah. who could yeah. really understand, like explain to them how to do pair coding instead of pairing I, wine with absolutely. food. You could, like talk about, you know, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe coders. instead of pa pairing, <laughs> pairing wine with food, you're pairing, pairing with a developer. 
That'd be a funny one. Yeah. But to, for tonight's pairing, we have Q animation person. Too, yeah. <laughs> that'd be great. Um, no, that'd be that'd be actually fun. For the third course today, we have we have a DevOps person who's going to explain. <laughs> oh, that's fabulous. Yeah, I, I I love that. I think I'm going to use this one. So yeah, I th- I, th- I think absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I'll give you an example from early on in my career, where you know I'm wearing one of those Blackberries and and it's the middle of the night. I get woken up and it's daylight savings time, and we have a customer that's complaining, and it's costing hundreds of thousands of dollars that the, the glitch in the software. So we rush to hot fix this to deploy the thing, all of that. I think I you know passes validation testing. I don't sleep for a while. Like okay, we, we have a war room assembled for this. Everything goes well, supposedly, or I think so. And then in the next daylight savings time I get the same issue. Come back again. Because what happened in there is like nobody understood how this needed to be deployed and how this needed to be put out there. And so people who were making such a big deal out of this issue, which was a really big business issue for the customer, didn't really understand what it takes to deploy that hotfix to really address the issue for the customer. And so I think if they were pairing with their DevOps person, if they were pairing at that there point, maybe they would understand, like, wait a second, just because this got to this point, it didn't get to the, to the final point. And I think just that level of appreciation, if you are a company that really, again, depends on technological innovation and shipping value to the customer via some version of code, these are your craftspeople that you want to cherish the most. And you, and you want to understand them, you want to give them, give them the tools they need, and you want them to tell you what really matters to improve their lifestyle. And not, so it's frivolous, not more beers on tap type of situation, yeah. but like- <laughs> Extra like pizza. More, yeah, extra <laughs> pizza, yeah, extra toppings. But no, it's how did they do what they need to do faster, better, more reliably. And then you start questioning some of these things of like, I remember in one of the companies, we asked for double monitors and then we had to like show a study that showed that like dual monitors were like helping with productivity and so forth and so forth. It's like, it's an interesting example of like, great. So, so somebody trusted that. It's like, like, does it really work? And when it was shown that it really works, like, great, here's, let's just go do this for everybody. I think you touched on a few really critical pieces. One was sort of pairing with people who can really support developers so that they're not having to worry about how stuff is deployed. There's insights into, into how different ways in which they can work are more effective and can create a lot of some more powerful experiences, better experiences. But I kind of want to go back to that idea of, especially when you got up that great example of the hot fix and how you need to have an understanding of how the code is deployed to really address the customer piece too. Do you feel like that, dev, let's say the DevOps person or that site reliability engineer and the developer, those that the pairing of maybe the dev and the ops, do you feel like those two need to be in the same physical location in order to, to gel as a team from a culture, and especially from the experience you've had in starting these companies? Or do you feel like those connections, that culture can be created no matter where they are? And what time, when time zone, of course, matters too, but do you feel like that flexibility is not only not a deterrent you know, for productivity, but it's, it's, it can be helpful and it can help people in that, that developer lifestyle and create even better results by having that flexible lifestyle. Yeah, I think context matters a lot. Context of what you're trying to build, customer context, context of your work environment, whether you're co-located and sitting next to a PM and a QA and a DevOps or whoever else you, know, you need, or, or whether you're remote or partially remote. I think all those contexts, all of that matters. And out of that context, clever people that we all are can bear some really interesting solutions. And if you assume that you're always gonna that you're always gonna be able to turn around and talk to your dean for whatever reason, you may <laughs> not be things or you may not be having a paper trail, so to speak. But if you expect that your dean may be in a different office or working from home or that tomorrow maybe someone else is going to join, then you want to think about that differently. And I think yeah. that context matters. So context matters. is important too. Uh, Conte- context, is context matters. And yeah. so, yeah. you know, there, there's nothing comparing two cultures, one in person, one fully remote. So a while ago, we had a really interesting example that was being publicly championed by 37 Signals slash Basecamp crew. Uh, oh, Ryan, what is um, 37 the Signals? They, what, what do they do? What's the what's that company? That That is the company behind Basecamp. Basecamp. It's, yeah, collaboration software. 
task management, all, all those things they do for, for, for small teams and companies. And they had the intentionality behind working a certain way they did, the two hours in a week or being remote or and, and, and how they were, they, were, they were going about it. And that is a great example of fairly a while ago, that was, that was over 15 years ago, I think, by now, when they really championed that, of something that existed and thrived. But context matters, and there are a number of really great successful companies that insist on being in person for various reasons and believe in that collocation as a kind of like a table stakes feature in certain fixed office hours and things like that. And so I think when you start with such a strong founding kind of cultural element, that sets the context that really matters. And then out of that context, you're going to have different solutions for how you Peer review code, for example, is very different <laughs> if you're expected to do this in person in a room showing on a board on slide decks your own code. Well, I had that experience. Or you're actually doing this completely asynchronously using GitHub or GitLabs or whatever else. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And do you feel like there's, it's not a binary choice, whether it's remote or whether it's in-person, like you said, it's context. And do you feel like it's really about two pieces, actually, do you feel like it's really about choice? And when I say choice, meaning individuals yeah. who need to work the right way, you know, in order to address the context. And another piece of that too, is our companies being hindered from a talent perspective because they're too rigid and require people to be in-person or do you feel like there's a mix of developers who, who want to work in different ways and it's not just about, hey, we need everyone in the office or, hey, we, everyone should be remote, but it's just giving. As long as developers have choice, then companies can be competitive from a talent perspective. Yeah, several really great topics in there. First is there seemed to be, prior to the pandemic and whatnot, there seemed to be quite a bit of rigidity that you're either fully in the remote camp or fully in the in-person collocation camp. And I think what we've seen happen over the last couple of years is that you can kind of be fluid <laughs> and, you know, you can switch and, you know, you can survive and you can thrive. And there are a number of projects that, for example, I started in the last two years where I never met the people I started the projects with in person. And I would wonder, you know, somebody recently in one of those projects said how we need to have an onsite or like finally get, get together. And we were kind of wondering, like, but why at this point after two years of running a project? I love that. I love um, that question because I don't, I don't hear people asking that question enough. When people just, people just casually say, well, we need an onset. We need to get together. We need to have an all hands. And we need to have a team building experience. Yeah. And the really important question behind that is why? What is the purpose? Can we meet why? with, I have no problem. I love well, yeah. people. I love seeing them. <laughs> but meeting with purpose, I think, is really critical. Have a real card. So I love the Absolutely. fact that you, you're. You asked the question. And so I think we moved away from cultures being fairly kind of like, these are our principles, these are our values, and put those up on a website and come here if you like this and don't come here if you don't like it, to being a bit more, I think we're seeing <laughs> there needs to be some fluidity now because things get questioned and, and they may not be appropriate anymore. And I think being competitive in this space, I think the companies that are more fluid are going to be more accepting are going to be more competitive. They're allowing maybe some smaller teams to self-organize and if they really want to have some time in person and they have the budget for it and whatnot, they can go for it. But it's not a prerequisite and it's not like a set mandated thing that we must meet. I like that the concept of you know self-organizing too. Is that is that prevalent within you know with the developer community and companies? And do you see the e efficacy in giving teams the option, at least the choice to self-organize. And I don't know if you can you give an example of maybe you know, one of the companies that you've worked with or dealt with where you've seen that be really effective. Yeah, I think one way that you can think about self-organization is how far down the chain can you push budget authority or DRI authority, direct responsible individual authority? Like how far can you delegate that? And then the person that has that authority, that has the budget, that has the responsibility for the business let them make the choice, obviously within certain context. Yeah, is there any, any companies that you've dealt with where you've kind of seen where that's that's been effective and kind of what some of the great outcomes of, of that could be or have been? Yeah, well, at LTSC, we tried to champion that delegation of the budget line and the DRI responsibility because as I was talking at the beginning about being trilingual and having different customers, 
different customers and different problems require different solutions. And, you know, a solution for one set of a customer may not be appropriate for a different set of a customer that is or isn't regulated elsewhere in the company and so forth. And so we tend to delegate at LTSC very strongly that that budget line authority and the concept of DRI, direct responsible individual, who gets to make that call as to whether or not that is appropriate or they need to meet in person or those things when it comes to working remotely and working flexibly, where you are letting the people who are the closest to the problem, who are closest to the customer, to make the call for what's appropriate. Nice. And I think that would be a really good point in which to kind of talk about the kind of innovation that LTSC is doing. Give us a little sense too, um, I know you mentioned LTSC a few times, of what, what the company does and how some of the ways in which you've championed some of these developer experience, or whether it's remote or hybrid or self-organizing, how they've helped enable some of, some of the great innovation that LTSC is doing. LTSC stands for the Long-Term Stock Exchange. And this is a project that our founder, Eric Ries, talked about in his book, The Lean Startup, back in 2010, 2011, when it was published. The idea is to evolve capitalism as it is practiced today, so that really becomes a manifestation of stakeholder capitalism, of something that an ecosystem that helps companies run better in the long run for the benefit of all their stakeholders and really supports the sort of innovation and the long-term projects that today's environment is not set up to successfully support. And so we are an ecosystem of solutions that help companies at every single stage of their life cycle of their existence, from the founding garage table to fundraising to growing, preparing to go public, and then finally operating in the public markets. We have solutions at all those stages where we're helping companies make better choices for running their company and helping them get the right investors, helping them get the right employees, helping get and take care of those stakeholders they have. Excellent. And how do you feel like the choices you've made with the sort of developer lifestyle and some of the, the things that you've been championing, how do you feel like that's supported in advance some of the some of the great work you're doing and innovation you're doing with LTSE? So I'll give you a couple of maybe maybe three examples of the different types of products that we've built to date. And then we'll talk about the developer lifestyle behind those. So we built, one of the first products that we built was LTSC Equity. It used to be called CapTable IO, and we helped early stage startups manage their cap table. We, we talked about four founders by founders. We were repeat founders ourselves that, you know, needed a better solution to manage their own cap tables, you know, reward their employees, stock incentives option plans, fundraise planning and scenario modeling, exit modeling, all of those things that kind of start doing on top of the cap table. And so there you're firmly in the Silicon Valley world. Founders and investors are, and, and their lawyers are basically the three main stakeholders. And then you add employees and as the companies grow. So that's like one set. And you can imagine that customer base and that sort of a, a problem space has its, has its interesting developer choices. Then we also, in parallel, built a national securities exchange. We, we started from first principles. We built our own matching engine, for example, that every day runs in our stock exchange. And we eventually we listed companies and, and all of those things. So, so we had to go through the SEC approval process for that. Lots of, you know, this is an existing ecosystem that you're joining that is highly regulated. And whenever you turn on the news, people quote about how SAP 500 <laughs> or such is doing. Yeah, uh, exactly. And so this this permeates like this need to be fast, the need to be correct, need to be. It's just like it's a very different set of challenges that you have, and a very actually limited set of customers because you only have certain firms that are allowed to touch. They're, they're allowed to place a trade in your exchange, right? And then if you think about the third customer that we have, these are the IROs or the CFOs of companies that are preparing to go public. IROs meaning investor relations officers of companies, the folks who are doing the quarterly calls, right, earnings calls, they or who are preparing a company to go public or running a public company, they have their own needs. They need to process usually reams of data for their comp groups, for how the market is doing, what is happening, what are the investors doing, stock surveillance, like all of those things. And so in there, you're talking really now some interesting data problems when you're trying to analyze. And so those three different customers, and we built software that, that, that helps all those three different customers, requirements are completely different. The need for speed versus need for correctness, 
need for probability, so to speak, the need for, you know, just being directionally right in certain cases where you don't need to be completely correct. It just dictates everything from programming languages you select, from how you're running your software development lifecycle to how frequently do you integrate, do you test, do you push, do you release. Like all of that is very, very different. Yet, successfully, we've had people who worked on all three of those that I just mentioned, and they're able to move from a project to a project and be successful. And so the underlying principles, we had to set them up in a certain way. What was the core key pieces to making sure those developers could move from project to project and be successful? What was, what was key in whether it's the culture, organization, or capabilities? I don't know if you can speak to what those key pieces were. One of the core principles for us has been to really allow developers to select the stage-appropriate, customer-appropriate, context-appropriate tooling and technologies. And that results in practice with having, you know, in one place we're using GCP, in another place we're using AWS. And so, you know, some people would look at that and they would say like, oh my gosh, you're having a drift or you're having, you're having more complexity than, than you need to. In our case, we optimize for like the right tool for the job, the right tool for, the, for that particular customer, for that particular solution. Nice. And that, that becomes part of that developer lifestyle and based on skill set and Correct. preference and you organize around that product. And does that does that make it difficult for someone to move from project to project when you're when you're selecting different tooling and different platforms for sort of different products that you're putting into market? Definitely there is a learning curve, but I think that makes it a lot more interesting for developers who move. No, oh, I like that. I like that. That's not it's not a challenge, actually. That just turns the whole idea on its head. It's not a challenge. It's actually creating more value for the developers who are working on different platforms right. with different tooling and not just stuck in the same same platform, same tools, same life cycle, same process. I think that right. that sounds like that sounds like a, a much richer developer lifestyle. I hope so. <laughs> and so do you finding any other key pieces from a cultural perspective? that help those developers move from project to project and be successful. It sounds like some of those pieces are having our choice. I mean, that's a big part of the culture is choice. Are there other cultural organization or leadership pieces too that are really critical in making sure that you have that fluid success experience? Yeah, one of the core organizing principles for us is that we run the entire company on six week incremental cycles or twice a quarter. And we go through a planning exercise and fundamentally these are called pivot versus persevere cycles. Pivot versus persevere? Yeah, this is just lean startup methodology lingo. Yeah. <laughs> and so formally you get to then talk about like, well, are we doubling down? Are we proceeding on a project? But when you start running the entire company on these twice a quarter checkpoints, that's called them, check-ins, mm -hmm. you get everyone accustomed to the point that maybe beyond the next check-in point, we won't proceed with this project as is. And so when you start planning, you really think about how do I, in half a quarter or a quarter, end this project in a, leave this project in a good space, in a good place from maybe documentation perspective or code coverage perspective, or just like planning your work so that you don't have so much work in progress that it takes you three more weeks to like finish things but you know, that they are tied up as much as possible. And that organizing principle has really helped us move those resources from projects to a project based on need and really helps us have a lot more rigor as developers when it comes to why are you working on that project? Like, why is that still an issue? Like, why is that you know, this data <laughs> pipeline thing yeah. has been going on? Is it really worth it? Should we just uh -huh. like pay for this and like solve it another way? Versus, well, like it becomes a pet project and just like no one wants to kill a project. Yeah, I think that's that's a good point, which I want to think maybe as a, as a final piece to the conversation, I liked what you were touching on and how you started to draw the line between this developer experience, the project fluidity, the context, the culture, organizational principles, and then how you can articulate that to others who may not have that understanding of the developer experience. They're not developers themselves, they're business people, they're great at what they do, but they don't understand what that developer experience is like. And how do you explain that to uh, another technology leader to be able to really articulate the value? How do you tell the story of why all this is really important? The way I like to talk about this question or this topic with other, let's call it leaders, not just technology leaders at different companies, 
is that in today's world, there's pretty much nothing that software doesn't touch or it's like some sort of automation cannot improve. And we've seen this at LTSC as well, where you can imagine just how many like non-technology people we have to run a regulated exchange. And when you imbue product people, technologists into a cross-functional team that is tasked with solving a problem, and there are people there who are professionally kind of have a positive professional deformation <laughs> to look at how to automate something, how to remove drudgery out of the day-to-day -day work, you then start finding like really interesting solutions where all of a sudden somebody who's spending hours moving data from you know, a data source into an Excel and running formula like gets paired up with a developer, getting back to pairings, gets paired up with a developer and they're like, well, there's a better way to do this. Like, let me, let me just write some scripts for you that, that will do this and, and save you some time. And people often think like, oh, there's this department or this problem doesn't lend itself to automation or it doesn't lend itself to software. And in, in practice, I've actually never seen that be the case if you truly fundamentally allow people to self-organize and to have the right people, the mix of folks in the room, whether it be virtual or real, to work on a problem. And so that self-organizing principle and having that cross-functional outlook, I think, is, is fundamentally important and why you want to have engineers involved in things at the company and why you want to understand how it is that they go about their craft. I love that. I love how just you've described it throughout the conversation as a craft, like a chocolatier or a glass blower, and people really need to have that appreciation for it. So I think I'll, I'll definitely advocate throughout organizations and dealings I have moving forward with people needing to go go code tasting instead of wine tasting, so you can you can understand the craft right. of the engineer and, and can get 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 That's the right. artisanal cage free yeah. free range artisanal code you know experience with a, a coder out in the wild. I think that would be fabulous. So Tiho, this has been just a great conversation. I think there's a lot of really great takeaways from this. Why don't you share with the listeners as well where people could learn more about what you're doing, what LTSC is doing, how can they find you online, what you're going to be up to? Are there any resources people can look to to, to find those things out? Yeah, if you go to ltsc.com, that is our main corporate website, there are plenty of resources and links to what we do. I'm very active on my LinkedIn as well, so you can you know, link that. It's Tiho Baich at LinkedIn, and I post a lot about some of the, the problems I run into uh, and solutions, everything from working with startups to, you know, working with engineering teams. That's fabulous, Tia. Well, I appreciate the conversation, and thank you for joining the CIO Exchange podcast. Thank you, Adin, for having me. Thank you for listening to this latest episode. Please consider subscribing to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And for more insights from technology leaders, as well as global research on key topics, visit vmware.com slash CIO.